everybody? How's everybody? I feel like I've seen so many of you guys around. Are you guys warm? This is not even Houston. It's 30 degrees out there. Thank you for getting out of your warm bed, coming here today. My name is Lily Jang. Um, I was a news anchor uh, for KHOU for the past five years. Uh, I was a news anchor for 21 years total. And then now, like all of you guys, I'm an entrepreneur for Lily Jang Real Estate. And uh, I am excited for you guys to be here. And I'm looking around the room, and we have the most diverse crowd. How awesome is that? Yeah. You guys are amazing. Yeah, so welcome to the Small Business Masterclass. Um, we are going to get started this morning. We have such an action-packed morning. So thank you for sitting in the front. Thank you for getting to know each other. We're going to have a lot of time to mingle, um, network with each other, and talk to the speakers so you have a chance to really interact today. So I'm really excited to be working with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and to be here with you. Uh, Houston is actually the first stop in the small business series, and there are actually five cities that we're going to be touring to this year. It's going to be uh, Atlanta, Minneapolis, Salt Lake City, Washington, D.C., and of course, we're starting right here in Houston. Okay, yeah. By the end of the, this year, the U.S. Chamber will have hosted 4,000 small businesses. That's pretty amazing. So for the Chamber, nothing is more important than small business. That is their mission. That is their cause, right? And the Chamber takes great pride in honoring small business leaders like all of you who embody, who embody the spirit of entrepreneurship and uh, contribute to our country's prosperity. Because when small businesses thrive, our communities thrive, and then everybody wins. Yep. yep. <laughs> Did you guys get your coffee? Because if you, if you haven't, there's this corner over here. You can get uh, soft drinks, coffee. What else? Tea? Uh, water, whatever you need, so they're back there for you. Um, okay, so across today's event, uh, we're going to celebrate all of your great work. We're going to honor local business leaders and bring you ideas to help you grow your business, right? In honor of International Women's Day, that is this Friday. <laughs> this Friday, March 8th, it's going to be a packed day in here today. We're going to honor business leaders who are women. And we have an amazing, we really do have amazing women who's, who are going to share everything they've gone through and... Uh, Help us learn how to grow our business and scale it as well. I have two prompters here. I guess they knew I was in, in TV news. <laughs> okay, before I want to jump in, I want a moment to thank our sponsors, and without them, today would not be possible. MetLife, FedEx, and Square. Just a quick moment of applause. And of course, our host, the Texas Association of Business. They are amazing, so thank you. Okay, um, I want to also have a special guest in the room I want to thank for being here. He serves as Vice Chair of the U.S. Chamber's Small Business Council, Ian McLean. Ian, where are you? Do we have Ian in here? He's here with us in spirit, and we thank you for your leadership, Ian. Okay, I want to thank you guys for being here. We're going to have plenty of time for your comments, questions, engagement, networking. I know a lot of you guys are meeting each other, too, which is really cool. I love that. Um, the success of you and your fellow small business owners here in Houston is crucial to the success of the chamber. So everybody, are you guys ready? Yeah. Are y'all ready or half asleep? Come on. <laughs> okay, to kick things off is Zawadi Bryant. Zawadi is a CEO, and she is a co-founder of the women-owned Nightlight Pediatric Urgent Care right here in Houston, right? She's amazing. It's like before she even founded that, she was a uh, founder of also Z Inc. It is a supply chain management and procurement consulting firm. So Nightlight Pediatric Care is, I mean, they've won numerous awards throughout the years. And it was, they were also the winner of the 2018 U.S. Chamber uh, Dream Big Award. We're going to talk about that. Zawani's going to talk about her personal journey, um, her professional journey as well, give us some tips on growing and scaling our business. So I want you to help me welcome Zawadi Bryant. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you for You're beautiful, you. and you are so accomplished. I want to start with your journey. Um, start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and Nightlight Pediatric Urgent Care. Okay, well, thank you for the introduction. You're um, well, a little bit about myself. I um, started off my career as an engineer for Hewlett Packard. Um, fell in love with manufacturing, never thought I would leave manufacturing. Um, so I did that for several years, and then I um, transitioned into software development and, 
and then that led me to procurement mm -hmm. and then led me to oil and gas. So I've been in high tech, I've done oil and gas. Um, I've also done manufacturing and engineering and never thought about doing healthcare at all. You've worn so many hats. Yes. You really have. I, I, and I'm just, I just love just learning. Mm -hmm. So it was not a big thing for me to transition from, like I said, purely like engineering to then IT and software development. Mm -hmm. and, and so it just, I, I love learning. Yeah. And so when um, my business partner, Dr. Gentles, approached me about starting a medical practice, I was like, I have no idea what that's about. But again, being curious, I was like, well, I can learn. And between she and I, her being a clinician and me having a business background, we just developed a business plan for the urgent care that she was seeing these kids in the emergency room waiting hours because they had a cold cough flu fever. And when you go to the emergency room, it's typically for you know an emergency. Something urgent, right, right. Yes, that has to be um, addressed immediately. And so all these kids were in the emergency room primarily only because their doctor's office was closed. And her idea was if there was a doctor's office that would see these kids at night, mm -hmm. they would come. And so she and I researched and figured out, yeah, this was actually a very viable business. No one else was doing it. Doesn't mean that it's not, doesn't make sense. It's just right. that we're gonna be the first ones to do it. Right. And so it took us a while to research it and find who would actually refer their patients to us. We found that pediatricians were interested in referring their, their patients after hours so that they don't have to take the call. Um, and so we launched the business in 2007, and 12 years later, here we are. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so I was going to ask you about that. You launched in 07. Now you mm -hmm. have uh, eight locations. Yes. Eight locations. What has your experience been when it comes to growing and scaling your business? Yeah, so scaling, I tell people it um, means different things to different businesses. But I, for me, scaling for our business is adding locations. Mm -hmm. And when we noticed that people were coming to our Sugarland location from as far as Galveston, Cyprus, um, you know, Pearland, they were coming from, you know, um, miles away. Yeah, right. So we're like, this is probably, we probably need to have more locations. We gotta grow. We gotta grow. So community, right? Yes, exactly. And so um, for us, scale, Opening the second location was our first exposure to scaling, mm -hmm. realizing that the three business partners, because there's three of us, um, we couldn't be at both locations at the same time. We right. couldn't duplicate ourselves. And you couldn't clone, yeah, right, and you couldn't we, clone yourself. We couldn't clone ourselves. And so, you know, we, at first we would say, okay, one of us would be at one location, two at the other, or we were trying to spread ourselves, you know, with the two locations, and that didn't work. And so we realized that we had to put in some processes and policies that would allow the team to do the same thing we would do if we were there. Right. Like equip them to be just as, you know, hands-on and as, um, you know, intuitive as we would be if we were there. And to independently work, um, and, and, and do an excellent job without us having to oversee them. Right. And so that to me is the first thing about scaling is equipping your team to be excellent in your absence. Mm -hmm. And having the standards that you would have mm -hmm. to deliver the same level of customer service. Exactly. What specific lessons do you feel like you learned about scaling, regarding scaling that you can share with us? So scaling, um, again, is, is about having that consistent people, process, and product idea, mm -hmm. and to be able to communicate that clearly to your team. And so laying it out just clearly for them what the expectation is. Um, again, you're not gonna be able to be there. Right. So scaling to me is that first thing, like identifying what the, the people, process, and product idea, what is it that mm -hmm. you want people to do? And then, and then you need to have a management structure or team in place. Um, to me, that's a big thing that 
was critical for us is that again, identifying we can't be everywhere at the same yeah. time. Mm -hmm. So we need people that are managers that have our same level of DNA that understand how I would do business, mm -hmm. that they have that same approach and that because they eventually are gonna be the ones that coach and develop the employees. And so I spend a lot of time working with our management team on what you know, the company culture is, right. you know, wh what we expect people to do as far as performance. And then they just, they just do it. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, as, as far as the communication, again, just, you know, we have over 100 employees and to get that many people on the same page, right. doing the same thing, it just takes a lot of communicate communicating often, you know, through different mediums because people receive information differently. Right. You know, not just email, but newsletters and internal Facebook pages and um, meetings. You know, no one likes meetings, but, <laughs> you know, right. in order to right. get people on the same page, you have to come together. Is there one piece of advice you wish you would have gotten that you want to share with all of us here today? Like one piece of advice mm. when you first began and embarked on this nightlife? Um, I would say the biggest piece, the other thing about scaling is the, the working capital, mm -hmm. right? Because everyone says cash is king. And without cash, you can't pay payroll, right. pay your bills. So to me, not knowing um, the, the right amount of working capital to have, I think that's the biggest I think, you know, you, you think about your startup costs and your operating expenses, but to scale, it just takes so much more money than I think most yeah. small business people. And, and you know, I, I love watching like shows like The Profit and all of that kind of stuff. And a lot of times you see that, like people are scaling and they just run out of cash. Right. And then I've heard a lot of businesses just go out of business because they run out of cash. And so I think that's the biggest thing for me is like, like you think you need like a hundred thousand, like try to get two hundred thousand, like I say, you know what yeah. I mean? Just, just the working capital again, because I think as you're scaling, you you don't know what you, you are going know. to know, yeah. right? And when you get to that point where it's like, ooh, I need this to continue scaling, you probably don't have enough cash to right. do it. So I would, that would be my biggest advice, is kind of overestimate like the working capital you'll need. Because again, when that cash dries up. You yeah. can't, you're done. You're done. You can't grow. Yeah. Um, that's a great piece of advice. You've often, often used McDonald's as mm -hmm. this example in regards to scaling. Um, what exactly is that example and how did you apply it to your business? Yeah, so, <laughs> so McDonald's to me, like traveling, I've traveled around the world. It just brings a lot of comfort to me when I see McDonald's and I see those golden arches and like my mouth starts to water about those hot hungry. salty fries. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so it's just like I see the golden arches and I know what I'm going to get. Right. And so to me, I, I, when I talk to my team, I'm like, when they see our logo and that baby comforted, you know, mm -hmm. and happy, that should be in comfort and a smile on their face, yeah. you know, just like the golden arches. Right. <laughs> so, right. you know, that expectation of, you know, I'm gonna get great care, mm -hmm. I'm gonna be comforted, I'm gonna have peace of mind when I bring my baby there and get a diagnosis. You know, I'm gonna uh, feel that I received wonderful medical care. And so that to me is like, I want to drive that message home, whether it's our Sugarland location, our Humble location, you know, our parallel location, I want, and, and some of our patients have gone to multiple of our locations. And their comment to me is that every, everywhere I went, mm -hmm. every location was excellent care. And that's what I mean by that. Right. Consistent, that franchise model, like I'm churning out these night lights and they look the same. Mm -hmm. You know, there's not, you know, any defects or. Right, that is you your know, brand. Exactly. And you want it to be a consistent message with a culture and the customer service across exactly. the board. I mean, I think a lot of us still remember Hurricane Harvey. It's still, it's a lot of people in real estate in my industry is still mm. suffering, yeah. um, barely coming back. And during that time, one of your original locations was heavily damaged by Harvey. Mm -hmm. um, 
walk us through what that recovery process was like for so many of us maybe still going through that. Yeah, so <laughs> I remember having um, security, we have security cameras in all the locations. Mm -hmm. And so we were monitoring them all remotely. And, you know, all of them looked fine. And then like a couple of hours later, we looked at Umble and it's like, the water kept creeping up. And yeah. it's like, okay, went about a couple of hours later. And then it's like, all over there's water. And so well, like, how many oh, inches are we talking about inside? Oh gosh, it was at least four feet of water. Four feet of water. Yeah, four okay. feet of water. So we're like, okay, that location's toast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Hi. Um, Hi. that's done. So, um, so the first thing was just the whole, like we had to wait, like, I don't know, maybe a week before we could even get in there. Right. And it was woof, just bad. Mm -hmm. um, and so the first thing I would say just recovery is like, A, know your insurance what your coverage is, mm -hmm. and then know what's in your lease, if you're leasing, or mm -hmm. um, for us, we lease, and see what's being covered by the landlord, what you have to cover. Um, because that, that, to me, like the paperwork, you know, just filing the insurance claim and staying on top of the landlord, what they were supposed to cover, mm -hmm. put someone in charge of that because the squeaky wheel gets the attention. Right. And so I had like our amazing operations director, she managed that whole process mm -hmm. and she just stayed on it. And, you know, because I had to do other stuff. So having someone focus on, you know, staying in touch with those two key people, your landlord and your insurance person is, is important. And then for us, the communication with our team, mm -hmm. there were some people that had to go out of town because their home was right. completely ruined. Right. So they had to relocate to Austin. So we had to put in a communication kind of, um, you know, zone where we were keeping track of where all of our employees were. You know, so-and-so moved to Austin or they're in San Antonio mm -hmm. or they're in a hotel or, you know, or they're at their home, no damage. Right. So all of our managers had to, every day we were checking on our employees. Where are you? Mm -hmm. How are you doing? Do you need any assistance? And then we would meet as a management team and get an update on where everybody was. Did you end up rebuilding right there in the same location or did you find a new spot? Well, temporarily we had to um, relocate. Yeah. Um, because that whole shopping center was done. Okay, so it's still done. No one has built, rebuilt there? Well, we haven't? have. Okay. We have since then. We have since then. But for three months, we were relocated um, in another, another um, part of town, mm -hmm. um, which was great. It was like a makeshift little operation. Um, we were able to see a lot of patients. Yeah. And then we, again, we, you know, rebuilt that location. And so Harvey happened in August. And we were able to open by the end of December. Fantastic. Yeah. That's pretty quick. And quick turnaround in the big scheme of things. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Before we open it up to you guys for Q&A, um, I want to talk about one last question with you. You won the U.S. Chamber's Dream Big Award last year, and it goes to a small business making an exceptional impact on the local community, and it comes with a $25,000 reward. Mm -hmm. So congratulations to you, you for that. Thank you. And uh, yeah. Tell us what that meant for Nightlight. What did that mean for you? Yeah, so um, I think it was one of the biggest awards we've won yet because it had a lot of national exposure. Mm -hmm. And the Chamber does an amazing job of promoting um, the companies that are, e even the nominees, um, I think they do a phenomenal job of getting your name out there, um, promoting your brand, your company. Um, putting information out there. So that alone was huge. Mm -hmm. uh, for our business, it's um, largely driven off of reputation and reviews right. um, because, you know, you want to bring your little one to somewhere where you feel comfortable. So having an organization that recognizes you, such as the chamber, mm -hmm. means a lot to us um, because, you know, moms are out there Googling and trying to figure out who you are. We're yelping, they <laughs> right? Everybody's yelping. Everybody's yelping <laughs> and trying to figure out, you know, who's reputable and who um, is, is a good, stable company. And so to be highlighted and acknowledged 
for not only the work we do in the community, but you know the business that we have and mm -hmm. what we've done um, to be honored by the chamber has been amazing. And the money that we did receive is um, one of our core values or our number one core values that we develop our, our team and we build up lives. And so we are using that money to um, um, focus on training and developing our employees. And so that, that's how important that money is to us is that we're pouring it into our employees for their development. Right, that is amazing. Mm -hmm. Right now we wanna have you guys ask questions. Um, so we're gonna have mic runners walking around. Yes, so please feel free to ask any question you like for Zawadi. Yeah, feel free to stand up so we can see you too. All right, I could use the mic <laughs> if you'd like, but. Uh, <laughs> Good my mind. name is Joyce Good Scott, mind. superb speakers and trainers. Zawadi, I've seen you as you've progressed. Mm -hmm. Congratulations, very Thank proud you. of you. Thank you. Uh, the, one of the things you brought up was getting like-minded people as part of your employee team. Mm -hmm. Discuss that because most people hire with their heart mm. versus a clear vision for the culture that they're building. Mm -hmm. And it matters to get people who fit. Right, yeah. So um, that's one of the things you learn as you're scaling your business is that, you know, you. what's most important to us is fit to culture and, and we can teach skill. And even when we're hiring very professional, skilled um, providers such as doctors, you know, someone may come in with, a, with an amazing list of credentials and training, but we'll pass on them because they don't fit our culture. And so that, that, that is much more important to us than, than the credentials. Um, so what we have is our core values, our 10 core values, and we interview based on those core values. You know, asking them questions is like, how do you practice joy? You know, and if they say, I don't practice joy, well, <laughs> you know, we just, that's not a good fit for us. Right. You know, or, you know, how, how do you, um, how do you celebrate diversity and embrace originality? And if, you know, if they can't answer questions like give us, you know, the open-ended questions. Um, so you probably won't be able to um, prepare for an interview for us because it's based on our core values. And we're gonna ask open-ended questions and see, you know, how they respond um, and if it's, you know, sufficient and adequate um, response. But that, that's what, how we hire. And then we also, beyond hiring, then we also uh, reiterate that during our training and development. And it's part of our core values are part of our performance plan. Like how are they adhering to those core values? So we integrate it and it's the fabric of the organization is our, our core values. And so, great question. It, 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 it took us a while to figure that out, but um, we've had a lot less turnover the people we hire just are amazing because they fit the culture. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Any more questions, you guys? Yes, I yes. see a lot of hands. Um, feel free to stand up so our mic runners can find you. Oh, gotcha. Good morning. My name is Tony Batista, and I own Floors to Love, which is a flooring company here in the Heights area. Obviously, we're in the midst of deciding how to grow. So my, my congratulations, first of all, on your accomplishments. The, the question is, when you chose to scale up, did you consider franchising? Yes, no, and, and why did you go the way you did? Yeah, so great question. Great question. So one of the things that um, I did is we researched franchising um, as, as an option. And it's just really difficult to franchise a medical practice. Um, it's highly regulated, um, only in, in different states, um, different people can own it. Like in Texas, um, only a physician can own the medical practice, um, which is why we have a management organization structure over the medical practice, but it can be complicated. But you know, have, if you set up the franchise and you want to go to other states, other states do it differently, mm -hmm. um, different regulations. So when I did all the research, I'm like, that's probably not the best model for us, franchising. But I do like the components of franchising, the consistency, 
you know, the, the people process and product ideas of, of figuring that out and laying that out for people. I, I, we adhere to that kind of model of franchising and our team always hears me. We have this thing called nightlight in a box. Basically, if I give someone this manual, this binder, they should be able to create, start a nightlight and run a nightlight because all of the information you need is in this, in this binder. Yeah. Um, so the franchising idea, even if you don't franchise, having that mindset I think is really, really important when you're scaling. I hope you guys get a chance later to talk to Zawadi because we'll have networking, we'll have time to pick your brain and ask you more questions. I saw some hands go up. So uh, make sure you talk to Zawadi in just a bit. Um, I want to thank you for sharing your thank story you. with us. Thank you are you amazing much. and such a great example. So we, we really have learned from you this morning. Okay, I want to awesome. thank you. Big round of applause for Zawadi Bryant. <laughs> we'll talk to you later. Okay. Right? Okay, thank you.